What's going on everybody, this is Spiritually Biased. I've been away for a while, but as of now, I feel led to come back and create a few more videos. And the series that um, I'm working on currently is called Why I Never Left Christianity. Now, in my time of browsing through YouTube, I come across videos as far as why people leave. You know, and there are many different reasons that they come up with. But um, as far as their experiences, hey, it is what it is. But when it comes to um, the stereotypes, when it comes to the supposed contradictions and just a wide array of things, I think it's time for people to see why uh, people stay. You know, some of the reasons that these people give are very inaccurate, uh, especially as it, it as it pertains to the Bible and the things that they state that are in it. And, you know, things such as slavery and that the Bible is responsible for uh, oppression. There's a, a number of topics that we're going to go over in this in a series concerning this. But uh, as for now, um, I felt led to make this series because I think people need to hear it. I think people need to see it. And I really think people need to see Christianity for what it really is and not see it for the stereotypes, not see it for what somebody and their mama said it was, but for people to really see what it is. And pretty much this series is going to uncover. It's going to uncover the stereotypes. It's going to uncover, you know, the, the propaganda as far as what people think it is or what they, they say it is. It's, we're going to prove that many of these things are our opinions and we're pretty much going to uncover what Christianity is through exposing these things. So if, as always, to those of you that have been with me since day one and looked at my videos, um, once again, you know, it's going to be a, a series where you're going to learn a lot of stuff from. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Hey, everybody. Uh, I put up a post yesterday on Facebook um, that said, what if the Bible is not the word of God? Needless to say, people were um, appalled by it, uh, disgusted even. I'm quoting them, okay? They say they've seen me preach. They have seen me cry. They have seen me minister. They have seen me with my hands raised, loving Jesus. And that's true. I was a preacher. I was a minister. I was a dancer. All these things. I was a gospel rapper. But if I can do all these things and you witness my sincerity while I, while I was doing these things, don't you think I must have came across something sincere? Something that's so valid that it shook my belief, even when I didn't want it to. So you say you're going to pray for me. You don't think I've prayed? You don't think I begged this Jesus I grew up believing in to just show me the validity? You don't think I researched and tried to prove that this Bible was no doubt the inspired word of God. I tried, and it's just not true. Okay? I now know that without a shadow of a doubt, the Bible was manufactured for control. I understand this. You don't, and that's okay. So you have a right to be upset because you've never been told these things. I am a teacher. My job is to teach you things you don't already know. Now, what you have to understand is this. If I say something that is outside of your realm of knowledge, okay, look it up. Don't just get mad at me and tell me I'm wrong and tell me, well, I have personal experience, experiences. You don't even know where I'm coming from. Well, I've done all the research you've done. No, you haven't. You may think you have, but until you sit down and have a real conversation with me, you will never know where I'm coming from. So when I tell you I believe in God, I do. But when I tell you I don't believe in the Bible or any character in the Bible, any, all of them are fake. All of them are manufactured. None of them ever existed historically. Now, understand where I'm coming from, because I'm trying to make this video short. On one platform, you have literature, spiritual literature. This is where you get Jacob, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jesus, Judah, okay, Daniel, Ruth, all these names, literature on a historical platform where you're looking to see if things actually existed, if the world truly was ended by water, these things never happened. So, so I thought that in the beginning the world was dark and then null and void and God looked at the face of the earth and, and informed all these things and then said they were good. But then later on in the Bible, he regretted making man. But we say God don't make mistakes. Listen. There's no way you're going to convince me that this God that you believe in 
who inspired, so-called inspired the word of God is okay with slavery. There's no way when your Bible teaches you that slavery is okay, that what our ancestors went through is okay with God. Then I have a problem with that. Okay. So first things first, we want to talk about uh, the proof or evidence of people in the Bible actually existing. Now, granted, we're not going to waste time trying to go throughout the whole Bible, proving everyone's existence, but all we should need is just a few people. Okay, so let's start. This is Genesis chapter 49, verse 29 is where we're going to start. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in a cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So that's Jacob right there. All right. So this is Jewish Virtual Library. Uh, their website. And we're going to do a little reading on the, the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron. Okay. So the cave of Machpelah is the world's most ancient Jewish site and the second holiest place for the Jewish people at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The cave and the adjoining field were purchased at full market price by Abraham some 3,700 years ago. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah are all later buried in the same cave of Machpelah. These are considered the patriarchs and matriarchs of a Jewish people. The only one who was missing is Rachel who was buried near Bethlehem where she died in childbirth. The double cave, a mystery of thousands of years, was uncovered several years ago beneath the massive building, revealing artifacts from the early Israelite period, some 30 centuries ago. The structure was built during the second temple period, about 2,000 years ago by Herod, king of Judea, providing a place for gatherings and Jewish prayers at the graves of the patriarchs. This uniquely impressive building is the only one that stands intact and still fulfills its original function after, after thousands of years. Foreign conquerors and invaders use the site for their own purposes, depending on their religious orientation. The Byzantines and Crusaders transformed it into a church and the Muslims rendered it a mosque. And this mosque is called Harem al-Khalil. About 700 years ago, the Muslim Mam Mamluks conquered Hebron and declared the structure a mosque and forbade entry to Jews who were not allowed past the seventh step on a staircase outside the building. Upon the liberation of Hebron in 1967, the chief rabbi of the Israel Defense Forces, the late Major General Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, was the first Jew to enter the cave of Machpelah. Since then, Jews have been struggling to regain their prayer rights at the site, still run by the Muslim religious trust that took control during the Arab conquest. Many restrictions are imposed on Jewish prayers and customs at the tomb of the patriarchs despite the site's significance, primacy, and sanctity in Jewish heritage and history. Well, just a, a little uh, fun fact. Um, Abraham is also considered the father or uh, one of the fathers of the uh, Muslims as well. More than 300,000 people visit Ma'arat Hamakpala annually. The structure is divided into three rooms, Ohel Avraham, Ohel Yasak, and Ohel Yaakov. Presently, Jews have no access to Ohel Yasak, the largest room, with the exception of 10 days a year. All right, so let's move on. This is Cyrus the Great. All right. And Cyrus is actually the, the person in the Bible that, um, that liberated uh, the Jews that were in captivity. And uh, if I don't already have that scripture up here, I will put it up here. Hopefully I didn't make that blunder. Okay, no, I didn't. Okay. So Cyrus the Great, also called Cyrus II, born 590, between 590 and 580 BC, Media or Persis, now in Iran, died 529 in Asia. Conqueror who founded the Archimanian Empire, centered on Persia and comprised in the Near East from the Aegean Sea eastward 
to the Indus River. He is also remembered in the Cyrus legend, first recorded by Xenophon, Greek soldier and author in his Cyropedia, as a tolerant and ideal monarch who was called the father of his people by the ancient Persians. In the Bible, he is a liberator of the Jews who were captive in Babylonia. Let's hit this one. All right, uh, celebrated king of Persia. This is Easton's Bible dictionary. I'm just reading some of this to to um, connect the scriptures with Cyrus. All right, so Hebrew Koresh, the celebrated king of Persia, who was co conqueror of Babylon and issued a decree of liberation to the Jews. This is in Ezra, uh, chapter one, verse one and two. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be filled, fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it into writing, saying. OK, they're not going to let me go there, but the bottom line is just to mention or to place Cyrus in the Bible. I'm not going to go through all this, but these are all the scriptures um, that are associated with this article. OK, let's move to the next person. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea. Pontius Pilate, Latin in full, Marcus Pontius Pilatus, Pilatus died after 36 CE. Roman prefect, governor of Judea, 26 to 36 CE, under the Roman, under the emperor Tiberius, who presided at the trial of Jesus and gave the order for his crucifixion. Okay, this is Encyclopedia Britannica. Let's go to John, and let's start at, this is John 19, and we're going to start at verse 10. All right. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except they were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee have the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whoever, whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard the saying, he brought forth Jesus and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that's called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. So like I said before, I'm not going to read all this. This is just to give a reference that just like I said in the intro that a lot of people that leave Christianity or whatever, you know, a lot of the arguments that they make are highly inaccurate. Granted, I'm, I'm not in your shoes as far as the personal experiences and the people that you deal with. But, you know, we, we got to keep it a buck. We got to keep it a buck because people look at their videos and, you know, they feel validated leaving, but they leaving due to a bunch of lies that people are telling because of their own failure to do research. And to be brutally honest, I don't know why this man was a pastor and he doesn't have it doesn't seem as if he has, has basic knowledge of the Bible. So um, it's, it's a difference between being man appointed and it's a difference between following the spirit and letting God lift somebody up. But let's continue. All right, this is Herod the Great. Herod, also known as Herod the Great and Herod the First, was a Roman client king of Judea, referred to as the Herodian Kingdom. Okay, Herod, biography and facts, Britannica. Like I said before, we're not going gonna to rabbit chase. We're just going to do what's enough. We're going to do what's enough. Then we're going to go from there. All right. This is Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time when she had diligently inquired of the wise men. So just to give a little insight or foreground, Herod was pretty much peed at the wise men because Herod inquired of the wise men where Jesus was. The wise men came to worship the king as they referred to Jesus as. All right, so Herod tried to be slick and try to inquire of them as if he wanted to worship him, but he actually wanted to kill him. So the Lord had um, advised the wise men not to go back to Herod, pretty much. All right, so Herod, not only was he angry, but he was very paranoid and felt threatened that this Jesus was going to come for his throne, in which Jesus was not trying to do. Okay, so this is why all this, this slaughter happened. Verse 17, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying in Ramah, was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. So this act that happened was prophesied year, many, many, many years ago before it happened by the prophet Jeremiah. Let's continue. Okay, we're going to read 
Um, this from Everett Ferguson. Everett Ferguson is a reliable author who writes the following. Let's read. Though it may be true that Herod was an extremely able ruler, it is also true that he was intensely jealous of his position. He killed the two sons of Miriam, 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 whatever, when his suspicions were aroused that they might become the rallying point for Jewish patriotism. Miriam herself was killed when his mom was poisoned against her by his sister. A man who killed a large part of his own family and arrested large numbers of the most prominent citizens with orders for their execution when he died so there would be mourning at his death. Okay, this is Josephus, Antiquity of the Jews, 17.6.5. 17 Okay, would not have caused much of a stir by liquidating a score of children in an escur village. Knowing of Herod's conduct in the Jewish scruples about pork, the Emperor Augustus was reported to have said that he would rather be Herod's uh, very pig than Herod's son. Okay, so um, what this is saying, or this last part, the Jews were not a prestigious people at this point. There came a point in time where God allowed the Jews to have a, a kingdom and they, they were somebody, you know, in the world. But due to continuous disobedience, God took all that stuff away and they were on the bottom once again. Okay, so Jews were not, you know, prestigious people. They are not on the top of the food chain or top of the totem pole. I'm going to skip down to this last one. Um, these quotes help us understand that King Herod the Great was wicked. So we should not be surprised that a non-Christian wrote the following about Herod's massacre of children under the age of two that is mentioned in Matthew 2.16. The non-Christian writer is Macrobius AD 395-423. On hearing that the son of Herod, king of the Jews, had been slain when Herod ordered that all boys in Syria under the age of two to be killed, Augustus said it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. Dicta 56, MALC uh, 3. Let's move on. This is St. Paul, the Apostle Paul. This is Encyclopedia Britannica. Original name, Saul of Tarsus, born 4 BCE, question mark. Tarsus in Sicilia, now in Turkey, died between 62 to 64 CE, Rome, Italy. One of the leaders of the first generation of Christians, often considered to be the most important person after Jesus in the history of Christianity. In his own day, although he was a major figure within the very small Christian movement, he also had many enemies and attractors excuse me and his contemporaries probably did not accord him as much respect as they gave Peter and James Paul was compelled to struggle therefore to establish his own worth and authority his surviving letters however have had enormous influence on subsequent Christianity and secures place as one of the greatest religious leaders of all time okay let's go to this is the Apostolic Fathers. All right. Um, these writers include Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, Harmus, Barnabas, Papias, and the anonymous authors of the Didact, teacher of the Twelve Apostles. Now, the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, they have a lot of quotes from the Bible. They have a lot of scriptures from the Bible in it, but this is a secular work. Their writings are not... Um, in the Bible, they're not divinely inspired, but they have a lot of scriptures in there. And that's very important because you can cross reference or trace a lot of Bible, the New Testament, at least to their writings. These writers um, include Clement of Rome, uh, Ignatius, I already said that. All right, Teaching on the Twelve Apostles, Letter to Diag. Dianetus, Letter of Barnabas, and the Mortardom of Polycarp. Now, everything written by the Apostolic Fathers is considered to be equally valuable. Theological is what I stated. I take it as they hold their writings of more value historically, that's very important, than any other Christian literature outside of the New Testament. They provide a bridge between it and the more fully developed Christianity of the late second century. And that's what I was, part of what I was talking about, of how the biblical writings that came before them, they use a lot of those scriptures and their writings. All right. Let's start with Antioch, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius of Antioch, also known as Theophorus from the Greek for God bearer, was Bishop of Antioch. He may have known Apostle John directly, and his thought is certainly 
influenced by the tradition associated with this apostle. En route to his martyrdom in Rome, Ignatius wrote a series of letters which have been preserved as the example of the theology of the earliest Christians. Important topics addressed in these letters include ecclesiology, the sacraments, the role of bishops, and the nature of biblical Sabbath. Granted, once again, their writings are not um, not biblical. We're using these people for um, or divinely inspired. We're using these people for a um, historical basis. He clearly identifies the local church hierarchy composed of bishop, presbyters, and deacons and claims to have spoken in some of the churches through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He is the second... He is a second after Clement to mention the Pauline epistles. Okay. So these people are secular people, right? They're not, they're not of, of the Bible, but this guy who is secular mentions the second of the apostolic fathers to mention the Pauline epistles. Okay. So they have to be real. <laughs> they have to be real. All right. So. Next, I want to talk about the, um, let me talk about this. He says, he's referring to the Bible talking about God made everything and everything was good. But then the Bible says he repented. And to me, it's like, sometimes I just wonder, like, are these people doing any real research? And of course, the answer is no. But I just, these people lead me to ask a whole bunch of questions. But we have to realize that. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Hebrew language is not English language, let alone King James language. Okay. So the King James was taken from the Hebrew. So when you're reading a Bible, if it would definitely help you to get a Bible concordance, it would definitely help you. All right. Or use um, Bible dictionary type tools. So. Let's go to this article right here, because I think this does a good job explaining it. Um, sometimes, you know, when, when certain things are, are um, just like a teacher, you have teachers that teach a certain way, but they don't break everything down to their audience that they teach into, to where so it could be understood easily for them. But I felt as though this one does it, does a really good job of that. Okay, Genesis chapter 6, six verse 6. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. What does this mean? The Bible rarely speaks of God experiencing regret. The Hebrew word used here is uh, yenahem from the root word nakam. The word is exclusively about emotions, a pain, a feeling, sadness, or unhappiness. The word does not imply that God feels he has made a mistake. Okay, this is very important, right? Or that he wishes to have done differently. It is possible to experience grief and regret as you, it is possible to experience grief and regret as you hear without implying an error. Any parent who has held a crying upset child as they receive a shot has experienced exactly that. Such a parent is grieved over the pain but has no illusions that this was the wrong decision. However, this verse does not mean this verse does mean God is unhappy with the current state of man. This is a low point in the history of humanity. God is troubled. He is grieved or pained by the outcome of his act of creation. The men and women, however, do not grieve their own sin. They do not repent. God's grief stands in great contrast to that of his creatures who blindly continue to indulge in every sinful thought, action, and word that begins in their hearts and minds. Left alone, the evil of man will eventually overtake the entire race and there will be no godly people left. There will be no line to produce the already promised Messiah. Genesis 3.15, God will not let the earth go on like this indefinitely. So, the last thing I want to talk about before we move on is he questioned whether or not there was a worldwide flood. And um, this is very uh, interesting because, you know, the ark was found by Ron Wyatt. All right, and why is that important? It was found in Turkey, in a point where uh, Ar Ararat is. All right, why is this important? Let's go to um, Genesis chapter six, verse fourteen. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms that shall make 
Thou shalt make an ark and shall pitch it in with with and without within and without with pitch. All right. So we just want to link that. That God told him to make a um an ark. So this is Genesis chapter eight. And let's go to verse four. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. So Ron Wyatt found the ark in the same region or the same area that the Bible said that it rested. So um, on top of that, this thing was was not done in a corner. This was not a thing that Ron Wyatt did by itself and just took a, a camera crew and said, well, voila, this is it. All right, Ron Wyatt was a, a Christian archaeologist. And he found a lot of uh, archaeological findings of biblical happenings, of biblical events that, of course, that took place in the Bible. Now, the the uh, prime minister of Turkey came out and and uh, you know did that little celebration, or whatever. But this was honored or uh, given a claim by the uh, prime minister of Turkey. So, let's move forward. So when you look back and you see where this book came from, it all started 325 A.D. The Council of Nicaea wrote this whole book, put all these characters in it, used some uh, Egyptian type uh, theologies, not theologies, but Egyptian type um, astrology, I should call it, um, to, to form the, the character of a lot of the people that's in this Bible. So, yeah, they were plagiarized, but... Um, they were never intended to be gods, okay? Africans didn't truly believe that somebody died and rose again. They did not believe that. So it's just funny to me how, you know, we're taught all our lives that Egypt had slaves and then we find out historically they didn't. Listen, we're being lied to. At some point, we have to use common sense that the same people who stole us from our land, raped our ancestors, hung us, why would they give us a book that would benefit us set us free why would they do that they would not okay so you say i'm not religious well why do you practice christianity because jesus was a jew christianity was not created until 325 a.d at the council of nicaea which was several years after jesus had supposedly lived and died anyway jesus wouldn't even know what christianity is he didn't practice it it didn't exist when he did so why do you celebrate christianity all right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and make this statement. Anything involving slavery, it won't be talked about in this video because I'll make another video where I will expound on topics dealing with slavery. So he makes the comment that Christianity started at the Council of Nicaea. And that's funny because the Council of Nicaea did not start until AD 325. And why is this interesting? Because all the books in the Bible were already written before 100 AD. So the time is, is very well off in that sense. So that's something that he's wrong about. Also, let's go to X 11:26. It says, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Okay. So, when was the book of Acts written? All right, so here it's estimated to be written between 8070 and 8090. But moreover, you're going to get between 8060 and 8090. And why am I mentioning this? I am mentioning this because it's between AD 60 and AD 90, meaning no later than uh, 90 AD. All right. And in telling this type of time, we know that 90 AD comes before 325 AD. All right. So that's another error that this man made in his statement. And it's very important. Well, this video rather is very important because it exposes some of the errors that people make when they make these videos. You know, I understand that certain people might leave due to them being church hurt or certain things going on. 
and things, but when you start saying that there's errors in God's word and that, you know, the Bible was off and stuff like that, you gotta come correct. You can't just say a bunch of stuff and come to find out like the stuff that you're saying, you did no research about. You just basically just, you know, pulled it, pulled it out of your hat. All right. So let's continue. Um, he says, Jesus didn't practice Christianity. Well, that's very true. Jesus didn't practice Christianity because Christianity or being a Christian is following Christ. So Jesus wouldn't be a Christian because a Christian is someone that actually follows Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> Definition of Christian, one who professes belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ, or in this sense, a disciple. Okay. Uh, if you go to biblical uh, Bible concordance, it'll say something like uh, Christ one or of Christ. So with that being said, even from the a biblical standpoint, Jesus could never be a Christian because Christians are people that follow Jesus. Also, the crucifixion of Jesus right here is between AD 30 and AD 33. So how could Christianity form in AD 325, where all these events happened much earlier than AD 325. Okay, so that's something else that he is wrong about. All right. So he goes on to say that Egypt didn't have slaves. So let's look over a few of these um these articles real quick. All right, this is daily. This is ancient history and encyclopedia, daily life in ancient Egypt, All right? Now we're just gonna go over some of these articles just showing that Egypt had slaves, all right? That slavery wasn't something that was foreign to Egypt, okay? So slaves in Egypt were either criminals, those who cannot pay their debts, or captives from foreign military campaigns. These people were considered to have forfeited their freedoms either by their individual choices or by military conquest, and so were forced to endure a quality of existence far below that of a free, of free Egyptians. It's another website, right? www.ushistory.org, ancient civilizations, Egyptian social structure. Egyptian society was structured like a pyramid. At the top were the gods such as Ra, Osiris, and Isis. Egyptians believed that the gods controlled the universe. Therefore, it was important to keep them happy. They could make the Nile overflow. And one of the gods that was, or the god of the Nile, Hapi, caused famine or even bring death. Right? In the social pyramid of ancient Egypt, the pharaoh and those associated with divinity were at the top, and servants and slaves made up the bottom. Okay, so this is something else talking about slavery in Egypt. Well, once this article comes in, we can get into that. All right, were Hebrews ever slaves in ancient Egypt? Yes. And for the sake of time, I want to try to go ahead and hit some uh, strong points and not ramble and, you know, deal with, deal with things I don't really desire to deal with. All right, so this is, start right here. Of the Egyptian papyruses, Anastasi, Anastasi 3 and 4 discuss using straws in mud bricks as mentioned in Exodus 5 7. You must not gather straw to give to the people to make bricks as formerly. Let themselves go and gather straw for themselves. All right. The tomb of Vesier, Rechmeyer, CA 14 BCE, shows foreign slaves making bricks. For the workshop store place of the temple of Amon at Karnak in, in Thebes and for a building ramp. So if I didn't pronounce that correctly, you'll just have to forgive me. The tomb of Vizier Rechmeyer famously shows. Okay. They are labeled captures brought off by his majesty for work at the temple of Amon. Sea mice and Nubians are shown fetching and mixing mud and water, striking out brick from molds leaving them to dry and measuring their amount under the watchful eyes of Egyptian overseers, each with a rod. 
images bear out descriptions in Exodus 1 11 through 14, 5 1 through 21. And here is a snippet. They made their life bitter with hard labor as they worked with clay, mortar, and bricks in very form of slavery in the field. Exodus 1 14 a. Right? Now, clues to Israelite presence in Egypt. This is something right here called the Merneptah Stel. All right, the Bernepta Stel shows that Israelites were in Egypt at one point. Okay. The Bernepta Stel states Israel is laid to waste. Its seed is no more. Not quite. So, I'm going to stop right there. And I'm also going to go over here. And you'll see this in another one of my videos, Lord willing. All right. This is, I don't know why it's, it's, it's delayed. Probably because I got too many uh, tabs open. But this show is going to go on anyway. So basically what this is, is called the Ipewer Papyrus. Okay. And the Ipewer Papyrus has the 10 plagues in the Bible. In the book of Exodus, you had the 10 plagues. And you'll see this in another video. But I just want to touch on it. So a pure papyrus is a secular source that has the 10 plagues uh, written down in this papyrus that the Bible had. So for all the plagues in the Bible, this papyrus, these things are written down in this papyrus, which is a secular work. All right. And so just to give you some foresight um, or some background on this. Uh, when God wanted to free the Israelites from Egypt, he went and performed plagues. Plagues to use Moses to dish out plagues against Egypt and their gods. All right. So this thing right here is the secular version of that. This is the secular version. So if this happened in the Bible and God used Moses to do this, and this is the secular format, then that will have to validate as well uh, Israelite presence in Egypt. All right. So with that being said, I think I'm done with this video. Number one, Christianity is stupid because it has people thinking that they can raise a Satan's dumpster load of hell on the earth and that all they have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me. And then they get to go to the kingdom of heaven because they got those three words out of their mouth right before they gave up the ghost. Not realizing that the most high isn't stupid. He knows your thoughts are far off and he knows the intents of your wicked heart and that you're only asking for forgiveness because you know that you're at the brink of death. But if you were in full health like you were last month, you would still be ripping people off, killing and poisoning people, and living that lascivious, filthy lifestyle you've been living. Don't try and pretend that all of a sudden you have some type of righteous conscience now that you know you're going to be dead in three minutes. You lived like a fool, so now you're going to die like a fool. Christians three to four hundred years ago used their religion to justify the stealing of Native American land genocide of Native Americans, men, women, and children, and elderly, and the enslavement of African Negro slaves, aka the real ancient Israelites. Christianity is single-handedly responsible for the fact that over 250 million people have died in the name of Jesus-approved genocide. Wow, where do I sign up for Christian though? Okay, so my opening argument with this guy is that he says, Christianity is stupid, but he, if he is what I think he is, which is a Hebrew Israelite, just by his screen name and certain terms like the Most High and stuff like that, I think that's silly within of itself because Hebrew Israelites use the same book that Christians use. So if you were to say that Christianity is stupid, then you had to say Hebrew Israelite doctrine is stupid as well because both of you are reading out of the same book. All right, so I want to start with uh, forgiveness. And basically what he's saying is that people that we as Christians believe that someone could just go around and do what they want to do and then just say, oh God, forgive me, and they would go to heaven. Uh... I'll reiterate this again. 
um, Christians read out of the Bible. So the Bible is the source and overall authority for what we believe and what we do. Okay, so there's no scripture in the Bible uh, backing that up. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. All right. So God doesn't allow people to do what they want and then turn around at the end of their end of their lives or in their deathbed and say, oh, God, forgive me. And that's a wrap. First and foremost. For someone to know that they should be getting it right with God or know what they're doing is wrong. And it's like, you know, screw God, then God will have to grant them repentance. God, as the scripture says, God is not mocked. God will never allow that that to happen where someone will do what they want and then come back to God when they want to. It, it doesn't work that way. As the scriptures say here, God has to grant them repentance. All right, let's go to. I'm going to go to this next. Hebrews 12, 17. For ye know how that afterward when he, talking about Esau, would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, in a, another place in the Bible, it refers to Esau as profane and a fornicator. Okay, not things of God. Or not mannerisms or character of, of a godly man. But here, it's talking about Esau when he forfeited his birthright. He didn't value his birthright. All right, so he just gave it up. Whatever. Here, Jacob, take it. But, it, the scripture clearly says, For he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. So he did what he wanted to do. And look, it, it was done. It was done. He found no place of repentance. He, he couldn't get that thing back. Let's go to Romans chapter one. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Now they were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Skip down to 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Well, you have people that, that can sit and feel as though they can play God, um, play God or play with God. God will give you over. If God is trying to reach you and things like that, and you just say the heck with it, God will allow you to do your own thing. God will allow you to go out there and then be become overcome with sin and whatever. And, um, he will allow it to happen. He will. I'm not going to break all that completely down. I'll be chasing a rabbit. But um, even in 1 Corinthians, I believe it was chapter 5, where one of the members were sleeping or having sex with his father's wife. All right. And Paul said, cast such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, not for the destruction of his body, but destruction of that sinful nature and that person. So basically, you have excommunicate that person. And to be honest, God will, will ask communicate you in certain senses. But the good news about that situation was he, he eventually got it right in Second Corinthians. All right. So hope God don't let you run no game on him. He don't let you do that. All right. Let's go to the next thing. He says that Christianity was birthed out of um, it was birthed out of genocide. And once again, um, in one part of the video, he was saying, instead of going to church, why don't you stay at home and read your Bible? No, you, no, man, you need to read your Bible. You need to read yours because everything I'm giving is Bible. But you're, you're not giving that. So I don't know where this guy got his information from, whatever, you know, but a lot of Hebrew Israelites are hostile towards Christians anyway. So he said that Christianity was birthed out of genocide. Now, I will make a video going into detail about that stuff, but I'm going to touch a little bit on it right now. So it seems like people, when certain people do their research on certain stuff, they come across as like the scholar, you know, like they own it. But when it comes to certain other things, it's like when it comes to certain other things, it's like the research ain't as strong. The research game ain't strong at all. Um, for example, you have people in our time 
that have led cults like uh, Jim Jones, for example, and said that what he was doing was of God. And in the end, he went and spiked the Kool-Aid or whatever, and spiked the Kool-Aid with cyanide and killed numerous people. But he said he was doing the work of God. Right. Here's the thing. You can't blame God for what Jim Jones did. Although he said he did it in the name of God. Okay. So likewise, if Jesus didn't say do this, if going around, if Jesus didn't say spread my gospel through killing people, then you can't blame Jesus for that. But you have a lot of people that drink the Kool-Aid and say, yeah, you know what? Because this person said they did it in Jesus name. They blame the Bible and say the Bible was, uh, the Bible validates that in which it does it. So I'll give another example. If I walk into a movie theater and I kill 30 people and I said, I did it in your name, whatever your name is, listener, you know, your name, should I go to jail for that? Or should you go to jail for that? Should you go to jail because I walked in a movie theater, killed 30 people and said, I did it in your name. Should you go to jail for that? And I mean, that's that's rhetorical, by the way. That's very rhetorical because let the cops come knocking at your door saying, all right, we take you to jail. First thing you gonna say, well, but I didn't do that. OK, well, Jesus didn't do that. And not only did Jesus not do that, Jesus didn't co-sign it or tell people to do that. All right. And the reason why we know that, once again, we got to read the word. Stop just going around believing stuff that that people say just because you just taking people word for it. Look for the receipts. Now, in the Bible. Jesus himself was crucified. So if Jesus is the quote unquote post boy of the Bible and he himself took upon the sins of the world and was crucified. In the description of the Bible where Jesus said that if I wanted to call my angels, I could call my angels to get me back up. And to overthrow Pilate and overthrow all these other dignitaries. But he didn't do that. He came as a suffering servant. So if he came as a suffering servant, how is Christianity birthed out of genocide? And on top of that, if his followers, the 12 apostles, were martyred for the faith, okay, how was it birthed out of genocide? Nobody, none of his followers killed anybody in the Bible. None of his followers in the Bible kill people to spread the gospel. But in turn, they were killed for spreading the gospel. So this is in the Bible. Okay, we're going to read a couple of scriptures concerning that. John chapter 16, verse 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you think that he doeth God's service. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples, his apostles and his disciples. All right saying that they people are going to persecute them and kill them for doing his will. So this stuff ain't nothing new. The crusades and all that stuff ain't nothing new. This stuff was already talked about and already proclaimed by Jesus Christ. John 16, 2. Next, we gonna go to this article where Christians want to know how the apostles died, okay? And we're going to go over how the apostles died. But I also want to make mention of this. You could research this yourself. Christians uh, back in what, like 60 something AD, they were fed the lions in Rome at the Colosseum for entertainment. OK, they were, were being persecuted and being murdered and being in prison. They were being persecuted. Even today, as I speak, you have people in other countries that are being arrested, that are being killed just for being Christians. So how in the world do people get the idea that the Bible tells people to spread the gospel through conquest or martyrdom? I mean, not martyrdom, but um, conquest and genocide. That makes no sense. But I will be expounding on that in another video. But let's let's go over this. How the Apostle Peter died. The knowledge of Peter's death is widespread among secular and church historians. He was crucified, but he thought himself unworthy of the same type of death that Jesus suffered, and so as to be hung upside down, which was done in Rome. Jesus saw this coming when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young and you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. 
This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. All right. So. And Jesus was telling Peter, that, hey, for my sake, you are going to be martyred. All right. How the apostle Andrew died. Once again, most historians agree that Andrew was also crucified, but he was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. Now, for the sake of time, let's skip down. I just want to go ahead, punch the points and move on. How the apostle Matthew died. Matthew, like most of the apostles late in their lives, became a missionary and was arrested in Ethiopia. It was there that he was staked or impaled to the earth by spears and then beheaded. Moving on. Bartholomew is also known as Nathaniel. There is scarce little known about how he died, but it appears that since he was martyred in Armenia, he too must have been involved in a great commission and taking the good news into that part of the world. Apparently, he became a missionary to Asia Minor. Sadly, most agree that he was basically flayed to death by whip, where he was literally torn to shreds. How agonizing that must have been. That's a lot different than killing people to spread the gospel, right? How the Apostle Thomas died. Again, not very much is known about the method of Thomas' execution, but that may be due to the fact that he was a missionary in India and was established in a church where there when he was stabbed with a spear and died from the wound. There are, there are so few historical facts that are available beyond this account. Okay, skip that. How the apostle Philip died. According to most historians, Philip's death was exceedingly cruel. He was impaled by iron hooks in his ankles and hung upside down to die. Precious little else is known about the process, but it's... Okay, precious little else is known about the process, but it is enough to know how he died. Apostle James, son of, Ze son of Zebedee, died. The Apostle James is not the same James as Jesus' brother, so we need to establish that fact. James is far from any re reliable historical writers or church historians, but it is thought that he was beheaded by King Herod near Palestine and not far from where he was a local missionary to the Jews in Judea. All right, where am I at with this? How the Apostle Jude died. The Apostle Jude who wrote the next to last book in the New Testament by the same name went all the way to Persia and it was there that he was crucified by the Magi. Moving on. Matthias was the Apostle that was selected to replace Judas who hung himself. Acts 1, 20 through 26. Reveals how this was done and some scholars say it may have fulfilled the prophecy. Okay, we don't want that. Matthias... He was apparently stoned and then beheaded late in the first century. All right, Apostle John. Uh, Apostle John, he, he was the only apostle in the Bible who didn't die through persecution. Granted, they tried to kill him, but he, he was the only one to escape uh, persecution by death. How the Apostle James the less died is the most inconspicuous of all the apostles, and he is called James the less to distinguish him from the other apostles named James and James, who was Jesus' half brother. James the less was martyred in a fashion similar to James, the half brother of Jesus, who was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death. Say that again. He was thrown from the top of the temple. All right. Thrown from the top of the temple. And then after he hit the ground, he was then beaten to death after that. The Apostle Simon is not Simon Peter, and true brother, but Simon the Zealot. Once again, very little is known about him inside or outside the Bible. All that is known about his death is that he was also crucified. Oh, I'm going to do this last one. I don't think I'm going to read this, but um, I'll just say this. Paul, it's right here, but Paul was beheaded. Okay? He was ordered by capital punishment to be beheaded. All right. So what we clearly see see here is that the gospel was spread through them being persecuted. And even if you read the book of Acts, when Saul, uh, before he became Paul, was persecuting the Christians, it caused them to scatter and to go into different regions and different areas spreading the gospel. So the gospel was spread through them being persecuted. Not them persecuting other people. This is Bible. And like I said before, I'm going to put another video out um, going into detail, uh, further detail about that. But Christianity apparently here was not started.
through genocide. It's the complete opposite. Men risked their lives and they, they paid the ultimate price from uh, spreading the gospel to Jesus Christ. So let's move on. Number two, Christianity is stupid because it has raised people to think that if someone repeatedly does them wrong, that they gotta suck it up and bear it all, or else, hell fire. You didn't forgive that guy that tied you up in his basement and raped you and beat the living crap out of you until you couldn't move every day up until the day you escaped. Jesus obviously doesn't give a crap about you, your mental well-being, your traumatic experience, and your physical injuries, because he only forgives and have compassion on wicked serial killers. So Jesus is going to look at the very first reason as to why Christianity is stupid in this here video, and he's going to forgive the guy that raped and tortured you, but he ain't going to forgive you for not forgiving him. Makes sense, huh? Number 3. Christianity is stupid because it's based off of fraudulent so-called facts that are really lies. This upcoming Sunday, instead of going to your local church, why don't you stay home and read your Bible? The Son of the Most High was not a white man with stringy horse hair. He was a man whose feet looked like they were bronze metal that was burned in a furnace. Also consider the fact that without sunscreen in the hot wilderness, white people tend to get overly sunburned and baked like a pot pie in the sun. So with that in consideration, we must come to the conclusion that a white man with stringy hair would not have survived walking in the sun with no food to eat, no sunscreen, and no water to bathe in or drink, while extending his time out there to 40 days and 40 nights. A white man spending 40 days in the sun with no sunscreen? Come on now, white people can barely stand the sun for 12 hours. No offense. So, uh, one thing I want to touch on, and I meant to touch on it with the last clip, but I'm going to touch on it here. He made a comment saying that a woman could be raped, but God will forgive the rapist and won't forgive her for not forgiving the rapist. So let me go ahead and break this down. Um, <clears throat> the thing that makes the death of Jesus Christ of great value is this thing. God came down in the form of a human, the man Jesus Christ, and walked this earth for 33 years. And to, uh, to make a long story short, died a gruesome death, taking on the sins of man. Um, God didn't do anything. Jesus didn't have any sin. You see what I'm saying? But yet he took your punishment, your sin that you should be judged for. And took it upon himself. All right. So Jesus is the type to lead by example. It's not a do as I say, not as I do. He went by example. So your sin, my sin is on his, his shoulders. It was on his shoulders. All right. So if he forgave you and continues to forgive you day in and day out, how can you sit? And say that you're not going to forgive anybody else or forgive anyone. Let's get to the scriptures. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, so they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. This was why Jesus Christ was already nailed to the cross, was already spat on, already beat up. Okay, and this is what he said as he died for my sin and your sin. Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And anybody that have read that scripture before knows that <laughs> that's, that's very unlikely to happen as someone would uh, do you wrong that many times in a day. Let's go to Matthew 6, 14 to 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Okay, so I don't, <laughs> I'm just like a little puzzle because this stuff, once again, Christians and Hebrew Israelites read out of the same book. Granted, you have Hebrew Israelites that read 
spurious books such as the Apocrypha and things like that, which Christians don't read, but they both read the Bible. So this is in my book just as well as it's in your book. So why are you saying that this is stupid if you believe what you believe? But anyway, moving on. So let's address the whole white Jesus thing. And this is something that a lot of people are hung up over. You know, a lot of people do their research, but it's like the scripture the Bible says. It's like they um, they grow in knowledge or that they're ever learning, but never come into the knowledge of the truth. All right. So people say that, oh, you know, you Christian, you serve the white man's God. And the funny part about it is, is that Christianity didn't start the white man. When God chose to come down into a human form, he came into a form of a Jew. Jews aren't white. They aren't European. So that's an error within of itself. But it's like it's like rumors. You know, people hear something and then they just spread it. Failing to realize that this stuff just ain't true. So I'm going to show you why uh, Christianity is not based off of um, Cesar Borgia or uh, white Jesus and and how Christianity is not the white man's religion. Um, just going to give a little snippet. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water of the earth. Okay, so give you the urban dictionary form of graven image real quick. Because, uh, you know, I would like to, to go ahead and beautify everything, but I'm going to be pumping these videos out until I feel like to stop. So I, I want to get to meat and potatoes. You know, I'm not going to try to do a lot of uh, beautifying. You know, I, I might do a little bit, but uh, for the most part, I'm, I'm trying to get to the meat and potatoes and pump these videos out here. All right. So a graven image is basically something that men made. OK, so when men made idols, they made gods out of gold and wood and stuff like that. And they worshiped them, uh, made blood sacrifices unto them. These are graven images. All right. So graven images were worship. These were things that people created as gods. They would create these gods and they would worship these gods. All right. So let's go to Acts chapter 17. We're going to start at verse 25. Neither is worshipped. He's talking. This is Paul talking to the Greeks about Jesus. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, talking about Aratus, for we also for we are also his offspring. Verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver, or stone. Wait for it. Wait for it. I'm going to highlight this. Graven by art in man's device. So this picture of white Jesus is a graven image by art. It's a graven image. So the Bible is saying that it is a sin to make a graven image and granted, the people that was mainly doing this graven image stuff were the heathen nations. Were they called heathens because they weren't Jews? No, they were called heathens for the type of sins that they were performing that was national. Them as a people would participate in. All right. So if the Bible says in the Old Testament, in Exodus and in the New Testament, it's telling you this about graven images. How in the world do you incorporate Jesus or this picture of that's supposed to be Jesus? Uh, as something that came from Christianity where Christians go off of the Bible and the Bible says that you shouldn't make graven images. That's a sin. All right. So I don't think I have anything else that I want to talk about concerning this video. I think this video is, um, is about done. I think I said enough about it.